Hey guys, what's happening? What's up? Hold out that glass because we're going to fill it up. Welcome to the Prometheus Lens Podcast, the place where the conversations are always enlightening. And I'm your host, Justin, independent researcher and podcaster. Here we like to use the allegory of the Prometheus Lens to take a second look at everything. Well, today we have a, a second time around guest, great friend of the show. Love this woman dearly. We got uh, Karen Wilkinson, the author of the book, Stolen Seed, Evil Harvest. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Justin. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I love that we're friends and we get to hang out and just chat and and, um, just happy to be back. Thank you so much. Yeah, we have lots of fun conversations, whether it's through Facebook or, or text messages. This is a very uh, a wit- witty woman right here. <laughs> we have a lot of fun. I've lived long enough to learn a few uh, lines here and there. So. Oh, yeah. Which uh, we, we had her on uh, not too long ago when we talked about her book. And I told her that I like to, to read the people's books that I have on, and that way we can have some, some better conversations. So uh, after reading her book, I asked her to come back and we could take a little deeper dive and explore some things in her book that I found fascinating, which there was a whole, whole lot. So I'm not going to dive in and just give the whole book away. We want you guys to check it out. But I'm just uh, thankful that you sit down for a second run and we can go through some of these things. Oh, I'm excited. Yeah, I love it after someone's read the book and and, uh, then has more specific questions because there's definitely a lot more to the book than what I talk about on on podcasts and interviews and things like that. There's just so much more to hmm. discuss when it comes to this topic too. And it's constantly evolving and changing. So it's thank you. Oh yeah. And, and speaking of that, <laughs> I, I want to get your uh, opinion on uh, something that's hitting the news right now that everybody's raving about. Uh, what's your take on the, uh, the 10 foot tall aliens in the mall yeah. at Miami? You know, that is an interesting one. Um, I I think it's unusual that there would be that many police vehicles for a couple of kids with sticks and fireworks. That's for sure. Um, the what I've seen the video and the eyewitness accounts make it sound like there's definitely something strange happening there. Um, but you know we just don't have enough evidence to make an informed decision. Um, I do find it interesting that it happened um, at night because I don't think that these entities, if it were, if these were entities, um, non-human entities, I don't think they can come out in the sunlight. So that makes sense to me. Um, And I do think there's a lot of high strangeness going on there. I think we're going to see more and more of that as, as people are waking up to the truth. I mean, you see more people than ever now who know what a Nephilim is. Three years ago, if I had stood up in a crowded room and said Nephilim, people would have looked at me like, is that a cocktail? What is that? You know, (laughs) Um, we don't make that. No, Um, but now, you know, if you say it in a crowded room, probably half the people there know what that means. And that's crazy. So you got Tucker Carlson uh, talking about Nephilim now. (laughs) And Roseanne Barr (laughs) and people you never thought would have that in their vocabulary. So. You know, that says to me that the things that people have been putting aside as too paranormal, too far out there, are now coming into everyone's uh, realm of possibility, you know, and into everyone's vocabulary. And that's happening for a reason. Um, Is it happening because they're trying to infiltrate everyone through the media so that when these things finally are revealed that we're not so um, surprised or frightened by them? Possibly. I think that's a really strong possibility right now. Um, Certainly, you know, slowly leaking things like this out. um, I didn't see a lot of of, uh, denial on anyone's part about what was happening in that mall. Um, We saw an excuse, but we didn't see a lot of denials, you know, so I think that this is possibly just an opportunity to bring more awareness to people as to what might be coming and to try to shift more focus into the more 
supernatural and esoteric things that we are all familiar with and your listeners are, but most of the world is not. And that has to really make you think that something bigger is coming. Oh, coming of course. Soon. And I was like you, I mean, I'm a skeptic, you know, on all things, you know, mm -hmm. I like to question everything, show me what you got. Let me see it, feel it, touch it and, and figure it out on my own. And when I heard that story, of course, my first instinct was, ah, this is, this is crazy. And then when I got to seeing the clips, I'm like, holy shit, that's a lot of cops. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, they had like 150 cop cars gathered yeah. around. And then I heard that they canceled uh, flights and uh, yeah. redirected planes. And then I heard it, it was, power. yeah, it was over these, you know, unruly kids in a mall. I'm like. Dude, I, I've been pretty unruly, me and some friends in a mile. We never had that kind of response. <laughs> no. So it's no, like, so, you know, the response versus the allegations didn't right. add up. That was a red flag for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. It didn't but the fit. video, you know what I mean? The video was really grainy and it was hard to yeah. see what you had. And honestly, with, with CGI and where I edit videos and stuff, I... I'm really skeptical now, and there's a lot of right. stuff that I see. I can take one look at it. I'm like, no, that that's edited, mm -hmm. that that's photoshopped. But right. it's getting harder and harder, especially with artificial intelligence, to tell the difference anymore. It is. It is. I do. I didn't get a good feeling about it when that came out. I, um, I just felt a sinking feeling in my spirit, like there really was something bad going on there. But I don't know exactly what it was. But whenever they're around, I can feel them. And the presence, it's funny because like the day or two before that, I was telling some friends, I can feel them around. And it was just freaking me out. And I could just feel this crazy presence in the area. And I knew I was safe, but at, having been around there for so long, I can close my eyes and sense them. And it's, I can't explain it, but I think most abductees probably can do the same thing. And they were nearby and they were around and I'm like, what's going on? Why? You know, and I just had this really icky feeling in my spirit. And, um, and then that came out and I just, ugh, that just was a lot of triggers. Um, for well, it's kind of like when we get but, older too, you get injuries, you get arthritis, you can about tell the weather, you know, I'm sure right, exactly. that's a bad, you know, correlation, but that's something that <laughs> popped in my head there. <laughs> I'm old. I get that. Yeah. No, but yeah, it does. It's it, you know, when it was before that happened. And so then that, that pops up and then, you know, now then they have these new hearings in um, Congress that happened this week, the closed door hearings. And supposedly there's some new um, videos about to be released. I don't know. I saw that on Newsmax this morning, but I didn't see the videos that were supposed to be associated with it. And something about, um, you know, craft that were the size of bigger than a football stadium, you know, which lines up with some of the things I've seen. Um, and um, them talking about, you know, there's, we're going to release more information to Congress about the craft that they've recovered. And of course, the congressmen are saying, we don't believe it. You know, by the time it gets to that point, they'll pull it back and redact it and say it's too classified. So, but there's just, there is so much more conversation now than there's ever been before. I mean, to have our, our congressmen and women speaking about this publicly on, it was on my local Fox news station. It was on a couple of the other independent news stations. And I'm like, I never expected in my lifetime to hear our local news stations speaking cohesively coherently about ufos aliens crash craft recovered bodies and now it's just on our regular news stations as if it's just another just another story it's and that no makes me deal. question it too because i yeah. question authority and uh i follow uh bill cooper you know i read his book you know Be behold a pale horse mm -hmm. and then i also watched his documentary and uh that was uh, the hour of the time. And that man, he was way time. before his time. Mm -hmm. And when I followed him, you know, he was saying that his first encounter was uh, he was in the Navy to start with in the military. And he was in, in military intelligence. And 
I think he said they were out uh, off the California coast, out in the Pacific Ocean, and he was on the the watch, and he said he just saw this disc just come up out of the of the water. Mm. He said and it just sat there and hovered and spun. He said and it was just slinging out water like a fan. Oh wow. He said, and then he said it just hovered there for a minute. He said I just stood in awe, and he said, and then it flew off. So he said just like in an instant. He said, and I ran and got everybody. He said, we went and pulled up the, the radar. He said, you could see it on the radar. He said, then everybody come out on the deck. He said, and was looking. He said, and this thing came back. He said, but it didn't hover this time. He said, it just shot straight back into the water. He said, and the water parted around it like a bubble, like it had some kind of force field. And he yeah, said that, uh, that everybody was just like, oh, my God, oh, my God. And so they had the radar evidence like you know 50 to 60 people that, that witnessed it and everything and they documented it wrote it all down he said but when we went back to port they ended up getting like the which i'm not good with military terms but like the head honcho of their division or whatever and they sat down and interviewed these people one by one he said i'll never forget it he said i went in and he was like uh well sir what'd you see he's like sir i believe it was a ufo he said GD it boy what's the matter with you and he said he just started going irate throwing stuff and screaming and calling me a crazy man he's gonna have me committed and discharged and he said all this stuff he said then he said it's like he all of a sudden calmed down he said and sat back in his chair and looked me right in the eye he said I'm gonna ask you one more time what happened what'd you see out there he's like nothing sir and he's like you're gonna go far he said they made me sign a piece of paper saying I never talk about it, and <laughs> oh, and that's it. You know, everyone's been told for years don't talk about it. I was told don't talk about it, and now everyone's talking about it. I mean, I remember it's about fifteen years ago, probably. I know that we were in Pensacola Beach on a vacation with a couple other families, and. Whoever cooks doesn't clean up dinner, so those of us who cooked, a couple of the adults took all the kids out on the beach. It was dusk to walk off all their energy after dinner while everyone else cleaned up. And the beach is very busy that time of night. Just tons of people, and it's all like houses and a couple of big hotels. And we all stop, and all of a sudden, up in the sky, there's this huge UFO. And it's a big, round disc, and around it are all these little, smaller UFOs, little balls of light. And there's about seven to nine of these smaller balls of light, and we watched them dancing around and then one by one the little balls of light went into the big ball and then it just disappeared and we all just stood there and you know we didn't have I mean iPhones weren't really a thing yet it was pretty new and none of us had our cameras and if we did we didn't even think to take them out we had that UFO brain fog thing I mean there were so many of us who watched this and it's you know it's Florida we're from Texas so you know we say hi to everybody who walks by. So we went, sat on our beach chairs down from the house on the on the beach and let the kids play. And everyone who walked by were like, did you see that? Yeah, I saw that. That was wild. You know, everybody saw it. Everybody saw it. And, and this is over at least 15 years ago, maybe more. But no one was freaked out. No one was surprised. No one was like... I don't, you know, there's just such a general acceptance already that these things exist. So why is there still such a stigma around them? You know, I've seen them here going uh, triangle craft. I saw one day when the kids were really little, it was about maybe 20 years ago, these three triangle craft go over the big dam. We have a big Mansfield dam here. It's a huge dam. And these three triangle craft went over the dam and down into the lake. I didn't see them go into the lake because you can't see the surface of the water from the other side of the dam. And they just disappeared. And, you know, I know everyone around saw it too. But no one, there was no news report, no, no one upset about it. But, you know, that dam was a, um, was a place where, uh, like after 9-11, it was a target. And so there's always high security around that dam after that. And um, so you'd think someone would be concerned that there were these strange craft flying around that dam, which was a 
national security issue type place and no no, no one said anything so it, it's such a weird contradiction because because everyone's it's there seems to be so much interest in it and everyone seems to accept it so blindly yet at the same time no one wants to talk about it still and see, yeah, that it's makes still me not accepted too. conversation. I still can't go up to my neighbors and say, hey, I was abducted my whole life, and that have that be okay. And you have to just gently work yourself into that conversation so they don't think you're crazy. I mean, sorry, go ahead. What? Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, too, and I know it's not the case with all of them, but that makes mm -hmm. me believe that some of them are government craft, or True. in the very least in cahoots with our government and are, and are allowed to do these things. Cause like even with Bill yes. Cooper, he thought that his captain or sergeant reaction was because he didn't want the military looking like crazy loons just to shut us up. He said, then he said, as I went up in rank, he said, I got exposed to more documents. He said, cause I was in intelligence. He said, I started seeing things. He said that I wasn't supposed to be seeing. He said, and I found yeah. out that we were working with these things, that we had our own craft and was trading technology with these yeah. people. He said, so then I started talking about it. He said, but then he said, I started getting involved with MUFON and all these other agencies. He said, then I found out, he said that they were, there were moles in MUFON that were working for the government, getting paid on the government's payroll to give and spread disinformation about aliens and, and the, the craft. And he said, so yeah, now he said, you know, like his last statement before he died, he was saying that it was his belief that the majority of what we seen was our own government up there. That totally makes sense. Yes. I was going to play a soundbite for you because this um, was on our Fox News station the other day, but it's from the National Fox News. And this is exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, so these mm. helicopters that they were using in Iran at the time to track down Osama bin Laden were part of advanced technology that came out of Wright-Patterson in Area 51 and were reverse engineered, but it wasn't part of the general public's knowledge. You know, and then now they're just saying this stuff on the news, like, oh, yeah, it's fine to know this. You know, this is just reverse engineering from UFOs. It's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so... It's just so confusing now because it's like, be quiet, but don't be quiet. We're not going to talk about it, but we are going to talk about it. And it's it's the same back and forth that we get constantly from those in positions of power and authority and wealth who are making choices for us about what we get to know and what we don't know. And and it's it's sickening based on what I have seen in my lifetime, you know, happening with these things. Well, that's a good segue for uh, the next question I had. Uh, you mentioned the uh, the Granada Treaty. Mm -hmm. Now, for those that are yeah. not familiar with that, explain what that is. What what people, you know, theorize that is, and what happened, what took place, who were the actors, and just kind of give us a, a rundown of of the Granada Treaty. Sure, I'm going to pull it up in here so I don't get anything wrong as far as um, the dates, but. Um, yeah, according to, this is a quote, according to a retired state representative from New Hampshire, President Eisenhower did meet with aliens in 1954. Um, the Granada Treaty was apparently a treaty um, in the mid-50s that was attempt, was started during Eisenhower's term and unsuccessfully implemented by President Eisenhower. That is the same time that this group called the Majestic 12 came into being. And we have had some of those documents leaked. Somebody took a picture of some of their documents and released them. So we know, um, based on those documents, that there's some credence to this. And at that time, there apparently was an agreement struck between the powers that be um, here in the United States and alien non-human alien entities to allow for the exchange of technology and in return they would be allowed to utilize humans and animals for experimentation 
and the agreement was that they were supposed to let the government know who they were experimenting on and what animals they were taking and where. Um, obviously, that didn't, that wasn't upheld, that side of the agreement. But you're also, you know, what they didn't realize is they were working with fallen entities, entities that weren't following God that had rebelled, rebellious entities, not to get too, you know, religious on everyone, but this is what these things are. If you want to, you know, we need to really identify who and what they are. Um, and so, of course, they're going to be deceptive. Um, and they didn't realize what they were dealing with, which is why I warn everyone, don't go summoning UFOs, don't go do this, you know, contact stuff with groups of people that go out in the middle of nowhere and try to contact UFOs and contact entities. You don't know what you're going to get. You could get a good entity. You could get a bad one, but the bad guys aren't going to tell you they're the bad guys, even if they, you know, you, you don't know what you're going to get, and we're not supposed to mess with these things. They're so far advanced from us. They're so far much more powerful than we are, you know, and so in that, you know, back to the Granada Treaty, um, Obviously, these things were being deceptive, so they got the agreement. Everything in the spiritual realm, everything in God's kingdom works on agreements. You know, our friend Vicki Joy Anderson is a very astute about this, and if you want more information on that, I highly recommend her book, They Only Come Out at Night, which is also available at lamarzuli.net, where you can find my book. Um, but, you know, so that agreement has to be made somewhere if someone's going to be taken. I mean, it's just part of how God's kingdom works. There has to be agreements. So I believe the Granada Treaty was just a, a beginning of an agreement that opened a huge door for these entities to just come in and treat us like their own little country full of lab rats and take and do what they wanted with whomever they wanted. And it also created this environment where then now you have members of our country, whether it's government or off government or what have you, agencies working in in tandem with these entities. So now they're working together because they have to work together to get the technology because we wouldn't understand it. I mean, look at what they've, they've got these crashed craft that they still can't figure out and understand. So they need someone to explain it, you know, to help them understand what it is. So now they're working side by side with these fallen entities. And when I was taken, there were humans working alongside these alien entities. There were always humans around somewhere, you know, not every time. But there were many, many occasions where I saw humans. Did I talk to them? No. Did they talk to me? No. I kind of remember trying to talk to somebody in a military uniform once. And it might have been because I was little my handler was almost always dressed in like a military type fatigues and stuff. And so I might've gotten confused some at some point. I'm not sure why. Um, but I do remember trying to talk to someone once and they ignored me. I was just little. Um, but I don't remember that I ever tried to talk to anyone else. That doesn't mean I didn't. I just don't remember it right now. But, um, so yeah, the Granada treaty just takes us back to the point that somewhere along the line, there was an agreement made to, take people and and experiment on them and and that's terrible <laughs> yeah hey Psst. come here just act natural prometheus lands has a secret group. It's a gang of like-minded people searching for truth on what they're calling the hero's journey. They have secret monthly meetings, meet and greets with authors and speakers, and secret members only episodes that nobody else gets. These guys and gals also get all the shows 48 hours earlier than the rest of us. But a little birdie told me that you can go to a PrometheusLensPodcast.com and follow the members links at the top of the page. And once you sign up, 
like magic. All those secret episodes just pop into your Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever podcast app that you use. They make it so easy that your grandmother can do it. It's so cheap that your landlord is a member. You're without an excuse, dude. Torch's eye. Hey, you. Yeah. Put down that cup of corporate garbage that you've been drinking. It's most likely harvested in a third world country by slave labor anyways. Want to do your part to end slave labor? Of course you do. You're not a commie. You can start by getting your copy at KevlarJoe.com. Nick spent years fighting for your freedom in the military. Now, he wants to free your taste buds from corporate America. A cup of Kevlar Joe's a day keeps the commies away. Head on over to KevlarJoe.com. mentioned the uh the vehicles uh one thing stood out in my book when i read it, it mm-hmm. talked about you said these vehicles in my experience and opinion are living organisms of some sort so yeah. could you talk about you know what, what we're now calling uaps uh mm-hmm. could you uh, describe the craft and your experiences with it and why you say that it's a living organism yeah um because these crafts seem to respond in a ways that um, normal vehicles or things wouldn't. They move. Um, like when when I have memories of being on a craft and walking towards this edge of like the room where it seemed like the room went down. And as I walked towards it, the room moved to accommodate me. So the ships would move to accommodate wherever I was walking around them. And it's not just that. They seem to respond to everything. Like, the ship seemed like it was... They had, were communicating. Um, like, talking. Not like we have talking cars, but that's, you know, not too far off. But there seemed to be, like, a... The metal, the things that you see, especially the pieces that people pick up from the crashed craft and things like that, are almost like an exoskeleton and the craft actually is has some sort of a living breathing organism it it morphs and changes and like an octopus does um and they're not what we think they are they're not like an airplane or a car or something else they're they're actual they're actually alive and have autonomous abilities that just are so far advanced from anything you can imagine that we don't have here. Um, And nobody seems to look at it that way when they think about these craft, but I have spoken with other abductees who feel exactly the same way. These things are alive. It's like walking into a living animal. I mean, that's the best way I can describe it. Um, they move and breathe and accommodate you in different ways. Um, and, um, I think that's the reason too, that when there are crashes, that they're so hard for, um, people to understand how to reverse engineer them or how to work with them or how to understand them because the living part of it just dies and disintegrates and doesn't live in our, in our atmosphere and in our, um, our plane of existence and so we keep trying to fit these things into our earth our existence our uh, plane of existence and they really are from another realm even the ships so that's why it doesn't make sense how they work and the way they work and why they work because it doesn't fit into where we live and they're not meant to be here where we live 
there's something else completely. It's like when when I was in the ships, and there was there were times when I was taught how to fly in these things. There are little ones that are like like little ships that like individual skips. people can fly. Yeah, like not like the big ones, but they're little ones. But they're alive, and I sit in a chair, and the thing would just form around me. The chair literally just became one with me. And everything I thought and every movement I make and everywhere I wanted to go, it knew. And so it wasn't like I was steering a steering wheel or pushing a throttle backwards and forwards. It just, it was just a thing that we did together. We flew together, we went up together and came back down and around together. It was, it was as if I morphed like a, into a neural link with it. Yeah, like a movie a Avatar or when he would connect to the machine and he'd become one with the, the exoskeleton body. Right, exactly. It was just we were one and we worked together and it was and it just formed with me and understood what my capabilities were and so worked within that. And so I think when these things crash isn't so much um I think it's I think they might die maybe or that they've come into an area where they've lost whatever protection is around them because they've got to have some form of protection around them to be in our atmosphere and in our realm and to be here. And I, whenever you see the videos these that have been released recently it always looks like there's some kind of a light or a bubble around them. I think that's like this protective Thing that's keeping these things safe, and I think if like that Cooper said, is damaged in any way, they die. Honestly, for lack of a better word, you know, I mean, your car can die, you know, your dog can pass away. It's, it, and I'm not saying it's like a dog, please, you know, <laughs> forgive me, people. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying, you know, organic creatures die, and they are organic in a sense, and I think they can die just like any other organic creature, and I think that's why they crash. Hmm. Yeah, it's like that, that link sense. is uh, broken. And you talked about mm -hmm. that, like that bubble, you know, that's what Bill mm -hmm. Cooper said he saw when it went into the oh, water, really? the water just see, bubbled and pushed around it. Oh, wow. Okay. See, I need to read that book. It's on my, it's sitting there on my shelf. I just, it's really good. It, he's way before it. his time. He's even got pictures oh. of, of government documents and stuff like, like a good quarter of the book in the back is just nothing but newspaper clippings and and pictures of government documents mm -hmm. and stuff. See, uh, the problem with those books is, you know, I I've, I've got them and I haven't had them for long, but it was always so triggering for me to try to read those because there are some people who really are right, like Dr. David Jacobs and, you know, LA Marzuli and 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 Behold a Pale Horse. There's just some books where I've opened them and I've been like, nope, nope, not today. You know, that just, it's too hard. It's, it's like a reenactment of a crime scene that you were the victim in. You know, it, it's not pleasant. So, but I'm getting better about it. And I do want to read these things because I think they're relevant. And, you know, as I'm becoming more of a researcher and trying not to be a victim, but trying to be an advocate and a researcher, these things are more important and and so so yes i will read that book <laughs> sorry <laughs> no we, we appreciate right. it too uh and one thing too was in your book you talked about you know you were taken from a young age as, you know as young as you can remember right but most of your abductions you recall them taking place on your grandfather's farm mm -hmm. and then i also remember reading the book that you know you grew up in ohio close to the, the serpent mounds, you know, and all these, mm -hmm. you know, for lack of a better word, just, you know, spiritually or supernaturally charged places. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering if, you know, maybe there was some kind of tie in or correlation with these sites that had, that was attracting, you know, these oh, yeah. entities here. But also I wanted to ask, why do you think that it was, so often at your grandfather's farm was it in proximity to the mounds as well or just you just happened to be there a lot so that's when it happened mm -hmm. i just wanted to pick your brain on that yeah um i think a couple of things i think i was i slept later when i was at the farm and so 
that may be one reason why I have a lot of memories there. Both places were in proximity to ancient earthworks. So the house where I grew up in was really close to tons of, of mounds. And then the farm was also very close to a bunch of mounds and to the serpent mound. And I think that those sites are highly charged. Um, I think they are relative to portals and um, gateways where these things um, find it more easy to come and go because they've been, you know, it's it's like a train station that's been there for thousands of years and it's just a common stop and it's easy to come and go from that stop. So you get someone near there, that's much easier to deal with people in that area. You know, although, you know, these, these portals could be hundreds and millions of them all over the world we don't know but but we do know certain areas are more highly charged and that certain areas you know um are more conducive to these things so yeah i do believe that more of them happen there because of that and you know having um a family with masonic background i think that probably had something to do with it as well you know it's speculation on my part but someone probably offered me up as someone that they could take for their own benefit, whether it was a family member or not. It could have been someone in that organization who was aware of of me and aware of my blood type and my family lineage and all that. Um, so I think that there are a lot of factors that play into that, but I definitely believe that these highly charged sites are something to be aware of and to be careful of and not to mess around with unless you feel led to be there and unless you are prayed up unless you are there for the right reasons because they are all very dangerous and you can get yourself into a lot of trouble as many people have and there are many stories out there of people who've gone to these sites and been ver ferociously spiritually attacked to the point of nearly dying so it's something to be aware of for sure yeah because uh, i just recently uh talk to uh, Bo from the Bump podcast, and that's mm -hmm. actually at the time of this recording, it, it is going to be released uh, this week, and I, I cut a reel and released it to kind of give people a feel of the episode, but he was talking about him and a group of guys uh, from another podcast found one of these uh, sacred sites, you know, these ancient earthworks. And they went to uh, like film, do like a little documentary. And he said while they were there, they prayed over the site and tried to, you know, basically in a show of Christian force, he said, to reclaim the site in the name of Jesus. And he said, and everything was fine. He said, until I got home. <laughs> he said, I got home. He said, stuff just hit the fan. He said, I started having nightmares. He said, I never have nightmares. He said, spiders crawling on me in bed. He said, my daughter uh, started dabbling into witchcraft. He said, and started, uh, uh, we started finding spells and incantations and all this stuff around the house. He said, just, it, it really put me in the uh, thick of some spiritual warfare. Oof. Oof. So, yeah, yeah that stuff's that's, real. It is, and it's scary, and you just don't mess with it. I mean, you know, I understand the lure of going to these sites you know, when you're going innocently, like I did as a child, and we played amongst these mounds and amongst the spirit and among, around the serpent mound, it was a rest stop on the way. Uh, Sipe mound was, and I think the serpent mound was too. We would stop there on our way, going to the farm, and we'd get out and just run around and play around these ancient sites. We didn't know any better. I think to some degree we were protected by our innocence because we weren't there to find anything or confront anything or to claim it in the name of Jesus. We were just innocent. And, and, um, for some reason we were protected. We weren't, but were we, I mean, you know, because there we are playing around that and then I go home and I'm abducted. So, it's you know it's a double-edged sword say. you just don't it know is. and there was high strangeness all over the place so you don't know and i don't know what the connection was you know there's just so many things we don't know and that's pure speculation but there are a lot of coincidences when you look at those places and the things that have happened well when you talked about you know you being taken 
and the the transport i found it uh interesting that this wasn't just a a single phenomenon they were just after you you know you reported that in the book once you got you basically you described it as being shuttled and that you thought that you were underground somewhere but you always ended up in a large room with a bunch of children around your age. Mm -hmm. uh, could you just kind of yeah. go into to that a little bit and like, you know, where do you think sure. you were? And so obviously this mm -hmm. is something on a mass scale. Right. And it wasn't always there, but there were some times where there is a room that they would take me to and it had big round tables and little chairs like for little kids so this room was obviously designed for for little children or little people um there were toys on the table like strange blocks of uh, uh, just random shapes like weird uh, geometric shapes that fit into each other funny like um you know not like the kind of blocks we had at school um and there were normal toys too like coloring books and crayons and things like that and and there were other children there and you know some of them i really remember clearly one little girl who she had dark curly hair and her eyes were squinted almost shut i never saw her eyes open and she was always just hitting her head you know she was just like uh like there was something very wrong with this child um there were lots of kids some kids were fine some kids were scared some kids were crying but i wasn't the only child being taken um there were, and I don't know, and it wasn't in that room for very long. It was kind of like a holding space almost, like, a, you know, as they were doing whatever that, whatever that child was meant to be there for. Like a calming space or to acclimate you. Yeah, <laughs> right. I don't, you know, I don't know what the reason for the room was or why we were there. Um, I have flashes of memories of being in that room and there were just lots of other children. Um, there was a big window just that was, it was a big room, but this window was almost the size of the whole wall. Um, it was like a mirror because I couldn't see through it, but it, you could tell it was the whole wall. So it, it, it was, but it was mirrored, but not like a normal mirror. So I'm assuming they were watching us, you know, looking back on it as a kid, I didn't think twice about that, but looking back on it. I think they must have been watching through that maybe to see how we interacted. Some of those kids might have been hybrids or, um, I don't know, you know, um, anything I'd say about it really would be speculation. But um, there was a, there were a lot of other kids, lots of other kids. And you, you touched on it uh, about, you know, possibly being underground. You know, we talked mm -hmm. about Bill Cooper and he saw the, uh, the flying objects coming and going from the ocean. And then you even yeah. said yourself, you had witnessed firsthand a, uh, a spacecraft going into the water next to a dam. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's just talk and uh, theorize here. Like, do you think these are inner earth civilizations or are they, they portals to different dimensions? Uh, where are they going? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it's a combination of the two um, because there are there are things that happen that defy our understanding of time and space and energy and matter that are outside of our time, space, energy and matter. Um, but then there are things that are very much tactile and within our realm. Um, when I was taken, I know that, it, you know, we were in an elevator that went down and down and down and it went fast. And if you look at our oceans, for example, you look at things like the Mariana Trench, or you look at that, I can't remember the name of it, <coughs> excuse me, there's a trench in the Atlantic Ocean that's like 20, I think it's like 26,000 feet deep, and that's something like, or something like 12 Empire State Buildings would stack to something like that. I could be very wrong on that, but I know it's close. <laughs> but just to give you an example, if it's that deep, in the oceans, think about what's underneath our feet and how deep you could go down underneath the ground. I mean, we act like 
<coughs> what's on the surface of this earth is all that there is. We can barely explore our own oceans. And that covers what percent? 90? Is it 90%? It's like 75%. Percent, yeah. 75% of our earth's surface. Yeah. So, I mean, and we can barely explore those. We don't even know what every time they go create, um, some kind of a submersible that goes deeper or a camera that can go deeper in the ocean, they find new things, you know, even in the lakes and lakes in Alaska, they're always finding new, new creatures and new species of things they didn't know existed. We don't know what exists underground or under our oceans. And we certainly don't know what exists underground, but we do know for certain that there are underground tunnels and underground bunkers and underground things that, that we're not privy to the details of. And I know I was taken underground and these places were massive. I mean, they, you know, it, I don't think anyone can grasp the scope of what's under our feet because we tend to look at the earth as just as big as what we see around us. The vastness of our earth is so incredible. And then you stop to think about how vast it is under our feet and we have no idea how far and how deep that goes they don't know what the core of the earth is made of everything that we have is just speculation so you know and you get these science books that show this cored out earth and all these layers and stuff no one's actually gone in there to check and see if that's accurate so you know there's you could go so deep into the earth and create massive civilizations under there and we would have no idea no idea so for people to think that deep underground military bases are just a strange conspiracy theory that's ridiculous because that's already been proven that they exist but the vastness of them i don't think anyone is has any idea how absolutely massive these things are and what I saw was huge, beyond anything you can imagine. Do you have a podcast or small business? Do you want to expose that business or podcast to thousands of people each week for an entire year for less than one car payment? Now you have my attention. I'm looking for sponsors of this show. I know you have seen and heard the Kevlar Joe ads on the podcast and YouTube channel. I can do the same for your podcast or business each and every week. I promise you, you're not going to find a better advertisement value for your buck. My contact info can be found on my website, PrometheusLensPodcast.com, or reach out to me on social media. Let's talk, and let me show you how you can grow your brand effectively and cheaply. Well, it's just like people that uh, that are colorblind their whole life. They can't conceptualize or even begin to imagine the color spectrum until you put a it's pair of glasses or give them laser cor correction surgery, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they're, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. until you see it, you can't comprehend it. It's just hard. And how many colors do they say we can't see? We only conceive a few, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I see numbers in color. That doesn't make sense to anyone else, but it does to me. You know, there are just so many parts, so many things out there that we don't comprehend and we don't understand. And I'm just everyone, the color rejection, too. That I, I found that fascinating. One time I was taking a little deep dive, you know, just talking about, you know, or looking into spiritual entities and perception and, you know, how uh, Sir, Charles, uh, Sir Charles Eccles says that... Uh, basically that your body is a vehicle that any spiritual being can, can inhabit or drive like a car and that your eyes your brain is the computer basically and it mm -hmm. said that your eyes are the receiver so you know just like this computer screen right now that we're looking at if you hit show source it's going to be a bunch of symbols and letters and numbers don't make any sense but just soon as right. it's tr translated boom you have this beautiful full color picture 
So you got all these right. microcosms going on. So it's the same thing with, with you know, our reality. It's like, you know, it's right. built of thousands or, or gazillions of megapixels that our eyes translate into what we see. So just like right now, that sign behind me, we see orange. That sign is not orange. In fact, it is every color of the spectrum except for orange because that's the color that it rejects and pushes out and that we see. That's wild. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's fascinating. Or, or think about how the settlers, when the um, when the Europeans were coming into the coastlines and the big boats and the natives of the different countries didn't have those because they had forgotten or because you know their they their civilization didn't have such things they didn't even see them because their minds couldn't comprehend what that was on the water so their minds just rejected it completely and they didn't even see it imagine what could be out there their minds are completely rejecting and so we just don't see it or, you know, and you can have two people together going, oh, my gosh, look at that in the sky. And one person will not see it. So, you know, we there's it's just there's so much more to it than than most people will ever realize or want to acknowledge. And yeah, that's OK. If, if life if you want to live in that safe little bubble with your blinders on and that's your role in life then then fine but i don't i don't want to live in that in that safe little bubble i want to explore what's out there in the world and and whatever god wants to show me mm -hmm. i guess amen and that's why you got to be open because i mean like take mm -hmm. a i wish i had it to show right now but like in a rubik's cube mm -hmm. you know you have multiple sides each side's a different color so i can hold right. up this one side and be like this square is red and I'm not lying, but there could be somebody over here seeing a different angle, and they're like, you've told two lies. That's not a square. That's a cube, and it's not red. It's green, and they might even have somebody beside them. Yeah, I see it, too. It's a cube, and it's green, and then there's somebody behind oh, me. see it as a triangle. Yeah. yeah, and then there's somebody behind me. No, it's a square. But it's not red. It, it's blue. And you guys could be screaming at each other. And all of you are partially right. Right. You know? Oh, and, you know, that brings up a good point, too, because there's just so much dissension in the Christian church right now as far as what shape is the world and is it pre-post or mid-trib rapture and is it, you know, is it is Gen 6 talking about fallen angels or sons of Seth and there's just so and I could go on and on and on and on and uh, there's so many arguments going on and I just you know I've had a, a podcast pulled down because the person I recorded with he asked me very specific questions and I answered them very honestly and he didn't like the fact that it proved his theory wrong I'm not going to say who it was but you asked the question, I answered. It just proved what you were thinking. And But I don't want to fight. And I told him that. I'm not here to argue. I'll answer whatever questions you have, but I'm, I'm not going to create an argument between my Christian brothers and sisters. That, I have no idea, but I would no bet a $100 bill that it was flat earth. N I no, love my flat earth <laughs> brothers and sisters. It wasn't actually. But man, they get upset earth. over that subject, man. They do. And that's fine. You know what? I think there's a lot of merit to to all sides of these things, and that leads me to believe that it's possible that everyone is right. Because, again, it's perspective. How are you looking at this? It very well may be flat from this perspective, but from another perspective, it's not. So, you know, it's possible that everyone's right. Yeah, and I always It's tell possible people. that not only was there an incursion of fallen angelic beings, but that the sons of Seth were somehow corrupted from back in the time of Eve, because there's a point in the Bible where Eve says, God gave me a man. Did God give her a man? Where did this man come from? She didn't say a baby. She says, man, really. so there's just so many things we could go back and look at and be like, wow, maybe we're all right. 
And does it matter? That's what I was going to say. If it's not a salvation we just, issue, we can. It's dip. not a salvation issue, right? All these other things and, you can and, deep dive, and everybody be wrong or have a different opinion, and it can be very right. complex. But I'll tell you one right. thing: it's not complex. One thing that's so easy a child could understand, and God designed it that way for a reason, and that is salvation. And that's all exactly. that matters. Exactly. And that's all that should matter. And I think the fact that I don't think that having these arguments is new. I think the subject matter changes with generation to generation. You know, I mean, but I don't think that the arguments themselves or having these types of arguments in any kind of community is anything new. It's just something that's meant to lead us astray from the fact that instead of arguing about these things and throwing things at each other and and canceling each other and unfriending each other and, and blocking and each, each other, other and blocking each other, yeah, and blocking each other. Why don't we share the gospel together? Why don't we link arms and say, hey, I agree with you about salvation. I agree with you that Jesus was God come to earth as a man to live a sinless life, to to take all of our burdens on himself and die for our sins so that we could have eternal life, that he came for us. You know, why can't we just agree that we're going to go out together and share the gospel, share the good news, Amen. and leave the arguing to the people who are already out there arguing with each other and not doing any good. Let's Let's go find those people who don't know the truth and the good news, and let's share that. Let's not go say, pick a side, how, what shape you think the earth is, or how you think the giants came and went. And there's a difference between discussion, a good, healthy discussion and or debate, mm -hmm. and, and fighting and arguing. And you know, mm -hmm. everybody knows themselves well enough. If mm -hmm. you're starting to get upset or angry, or if the yep. person you're dealing with is starting to get, you know, condescending, you know, and hateful, somebody's going to be the bigger man or woman and just walk away. You know, I, I deleted a post on my Facebook uh, today, I think it was, just because I saw people starting to argue over it. I'm like, nope, nope, not worth it. Delete. I want going to have that. That's not my purpose here. My purpose here is just to share things that are going to make people happy, share the gospel, uh, help people with their walk, share my, my story, my, my testimony and, and bring people together, not pull people apart. I don't want to be a party that I don't want to get up there and have God say, well, well done, good and faithful servant. But, but you made these people argue and that man fell away. Why, why did you let that happen? You know, I don't want to be that person where I, I have something to do with that. I love a good, a good conversation with someone and I know that I don't have the education, the answers and all that to everything. I know what I know. I know what I've experienced. I know what I've studied, but I don't have the answers to everything. And I really enjoy learning, especially from all these amazing, you know, people who have so much knowledge. My friend, Scott Mitchell from Bible mysteries podcast, one of the smartest guys I know when it comes to, um, scripture. And I learn from him every time we speak and, and I love going to him with things because I know that I don't know. And and I want to challenge my ideas to make sure that I'm comfortable with what I feel. Because I, I know I could easily be wrong about my stand on certain theological ideas. But I know that I'm not wrong when it comes to my stand on salvation. And that's the only one that's really important, you know. So, but yeah, we all love a good, I love a good conversation where we're sharing ideas and they can be conflicting and we're doing it in a, in a healthy way and in a way that helps each other grow and, and learn. So, yeah. Anyway, sorry, get off my no. soapbox now. <laughs> we'll, we'll shoot that rabbit. We went down a little trail, but that's, yeah. that was a good, good rabbit trail though. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, no. Now, nah, me, Ben, and Stephen at uh, the Dig Bible Podcast, prime examples of that. Our ideas and thought processes on on a lot of things are totally different, but we're the best of friends. We sit down, and we talk about it. I say my mm -hmm. point of view, and if they agree, they're like, "Yeah, I can see that," you know. Or if they don't, they just say, "I don't see it that way." You know, this is how I see it. 
and then we let it go. Right. We're not, well, why do you think that? Well, what do you got to say about yeah. this? You know what I mean? Because mm. people That's believe what they believe, and 90% of the people that believe what they believe are firmly in it, and you're not going to change their mind. So the best thing you can yeah. hope for is just to go in, have a conversation, tell them what you think, what you believe, and why you believe it. And if they reject it and have their own thought process, they heard you, so it's your turn to be quiet and listen to them and move on. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We don't have to agree. Yep. Nothing says we have to agree on these things. And and sometimes these spirited conversations where we have different opinions, we learn so much. So it's good to share those things and not to be afraid to have a differing opinion but I don't care. Everyone doesn't have to agree with me. The only thing we need to agree on is is the gospel, is salvation, and and the importance of that. And the rest of it, will God will help us through that and help us figure that out. And someday, you know, we'll know what we need to know. We'll God, stand in front of know. the big guy and he's saying, it's we're all wrong. wrong. <laughs> yeah, I I really have a feeling we're gonna get up there and God's gonna be like, ha, 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 ha. guess what? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I had all y'all fooled the whole time. Yeah, no, I think you know there's a possibility that things could you know it's God's universe, it's God's world. If He wants to take something out of the Word and put something new in there, He can do that. And every Bible in the world would get changed if that's what God wanted to happen. You know, you can't put God in a box and you can't put limits on God. You know, our world could have been round and it could be flat and then it could be round again. If God wants to change the shape of the world, God's going to change the shape of the world. That's how God is. That's who he is. He is the creator. You can't, there's no limits. So there's no sense arguing over things that God can just say, eh, never mind. You know, I do think some things are, are salvation worthy, like deceptions. I mean, when I think about the um, UFO deceptions and things like that. When I think about the fallen angelic entities and those deceptions, and those things I think are worth worth trying to share only because it could lead someone astray in a way. Yeah, the old book of Revelation says they path. will be fooled and led astray by lying yes. signs and wonders. So that, exactly. that's pertinent. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's important that if it falls into that category, that we address it as best we can, but we do it with kindness and grace and love, not with a pounding fist and you've got to read this, you know, we're not like that. No, we do it with kindness and love and compassion and grace because that's how Jesus was. You know, when it was time to reprimand, he reprimanded, but that's his job, not ours. Our job is to share and to help our brothers and sisters find their way. And if they're not, then we pray about it. And we let God bring them to us in the way he wants to. Or God will say, you go talk to this person. And when God tells you to do something, trust me, I know, you do it. <laughs> but, you know, so I think there's just, I know we've gotten off on a really crazy path today. But I, th I think it all does fit in. And it fits into this and in, in that respect. Because a large part of what I write about, especially at the end of the book, is is possible scenarios that I could see happening. And how it could lead people astray. And, and these are my fears. Because being involved with these entities, you know, that it just, they are so deceptive and the level of deception yep. is Becoming so great. great. Deception, and as and people says. will not see it coming. Yeah. You know, yeah. He, you know, he just, there's, there's just so much danger in this subject where People don't know what they're getting into if they are summoning these entities or playing with the wrong things like Ouija boards or summoning UFOs or or doing ayahuasca or, or things that can put them at risk. You know, I'm not going to tell someone what to do or how to live, but I will warn someone. You're putting yourself in, in a risky situation where you could really be hurt. The same as I would warn my children, you know, look both ways before you cross the street. Don't get in the car with a stranger. I don't want anyone to get hurt. And these entities, I have been in their presence. They are deceptive. They are liars. They are cruel beyond all belief. You know, their their cruelty knows no bounds. They don't care about us. They don't love us. There's, they have nothing. They don't 
want to help us in kidnapping children and raping women and stealing, you know, babies and things. That's not kind, benevolent behavior. Um, it's, it's cruel and deceptive. And, and that's the thing that, that worries me the most about this and that I pray really hard about. And that I write a little bit about a lot about in the book is that this deception that I worry about the people that will be pulled into the deceptiveness of this phenomenon and, and what's coming out in the press, especially these days. Yeah. Amen. Well, Karen, I ain't going to take up all your time. Uh, go ahead and let everybody know (coughs) just in case they've been living under a rock and don't know, you know, who you are and what you got, where they can find you and your amazing stuff. Well, thank you so much, Justin. I appreciate your kindness and your kind words. And thank you, everyone who listened today to me ramble on and on. Um, the book is still available. Sorry for that noise. I forgot to silence my phone after we after I played that clip. Um, the book is still available exclusively at lamarzuli.net. That's L-A-M-A-R-Z-U-L-L-I.net. You can see it behind me. Uh, well, I guess you can't. Um, and then, um, there we go. And um, it is, uh, you can find links on that to my website, KarenWilkinsonAuthor.com. I am, um, I don't know when this is going to air, but I will be in Lubbock the end of February with L.A. Marzuli. You can find the link to that event on his website. It is free. As far as I know, it's still free. All you have to do is register. Um, come and see me. I know a couple of my friends who've said they're going to be there. Um, so I'm looking forward to signing books and talking with people and, um, and then uh, Prophecy Watcher is coming up end of February, beginning of March in Orlando. So um, there will be some events, and hopefully I'll get those up on my website if I can ever get that updated. Um, and um, so, yeah, just the usual places. You can find me on social media, on Facebook and Instagram. Just look up my name. If you find Justin, you'll find me on there. So <laughs> you can link through there to find my, uh, my, uh, my page as well. Um, and I think that's pretty much, yeah, everything for now. It's going to be a busy year. I'll be all over the place. So, and, and hopefully we'll be working on some new things here this year. So, um, good, good Lord willing, we'll have some fun stuff coming up soon as well. So we'll see. Well, once again, just, uh, thank you, Karen. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your fellowship and and your, and your wisdom. I really, really appreciate And your friendship. I appreciate it. Uh, Appreciate your friendship too. It's been amazing. You know, there's, I've made a couple of really amazing friends and I count you very high on that list. Um, through this process, it has been such a blessing and, and there's just, there just aren't enough words to say how much I appreciate everything you've done. Thank you, Justin. You're amazing. And I just pray that God will bless you, bless your show, bless the work you're doing and the good work you're doing and that you will reach many, many people with the good, news that you're sharing with the gospel thank you well karen you're a listener you know what to do close us out all right y'all well remember don't go looking up for them for ufos and aliens look up for him the return of our lord and savior jesus christ and until next time torch is high <laughs> <laughs>